the world's coral is dying off at an alarming rate. The Earth is on track to lose 90% of its coral by the year 2050. And scientists estimate that we've already lost up to 50% over the past three decades. That's why marine biologists at the California Academy of Sciences are working to reverse that trend. They've been able to get coral to reproduce sexually in a laboratory, a feat only accomplished once before. Scientists believe that being able to study coral under lab conditions will help solve the mystery of how to save them. I want to bring in Dr. Rebecca Albright, the curator of the California Academy of Sciences, to discuss what exactly they're doing to save coral. Dr. Albright, welcome. Thank you for having me. So tell us, what exactly have you been able to accomplish with corals in a laboratory setting? So what we did recently was we were able to actually bring corals in from the wild that were reproductively viable, and we flew them halfway across the world. And then we were able to mimic their local settings in terms of lunar cycles and sunrises and sunsets in a laboratory environment in Northern California and get them to spawn or to sexually reproduce synchronously at the right time of year. Well, you say that you want to turn coral into model organisms. For laymen, what does that mean? So for a lot of different organisms like fruit flies and zebra fish, we have these, we zero in on one species that we understand really in depth and allows us to ask some incredibly sophisticated questions about the animal's physiology, about their biology, the inner workings of every aspect of that animal. And we haven't really been able to do that with corals because we haven't reliably been able to keep them alive in a lab and complete a life cycle. Um, so we can keep corals alive in labs for a long time so what we can't get them to do is reproduce sexually. And if you want to understand an organism, you have to understand its entire life cycle. So that's one of the things that this lab may enable us to do is understand more sophisticated questions about coral biology because corals are incredibly fascinating animals. They have these complex life cycles, incredible symbioses with algae. They build some of the largest structures in the world that can be seen from outer space and are not knowledge of the inner workings of these organisms is, is really pretty primitive at this standpoint because we haven't had that in-depth dive into their biology. Well, they are also notoriously finicky. Why is it so difficult for coral to spawn? So to get corals to spawn, they usually only reproduce sexually once a year. And there's a hierarchy of environmental cues that need to happen in order for to trigger or elicit coral spawning. And so they need to, they usually reproduce in late summer, after a full moon, and after sunset. And so you have to be able to mimic temperature cycles throughout an entire year. These organisms need to experience a summer, they need to experience a winter, and then within a month, they need to experience full moons and new moons. And within a day, they have to experience sunrises and sunsets. And so in a laboratory environment, if you're using artificial lighting and artificial temperature control, you have to mimic all of those different environmental cues, which is pretty sophisticated and complex, but luckily, the technology over the last five years is enabling us to manipulate different wavelengths of light and the intensity of those wavelengths to mimic all of those cues and try to get these corals reproducing in captive settings. Well, given the complexity of the reproductive process, how is climate change affecting coral reef spawning in nature? That's a great question. So we know that climate change and ocean acidification both are challenging corals not just from a reproductive span standpoint, but from all different aspects of their life, life cycle. Um, we know that in a lot of marine invertebrates that early life history stages tend to be particularly susceptible. So increased temperatures in the ocean, increased acidity in the ocean, impair lots of different processes. They actually impair sperm motility. They will cause um, lower rates of fertilization. If embryos are fertilized, then they actually might cleave or develop abnormal Normally, they impair settlement of these larvae and post-settlement growth and survival. So it's this, this um, exacerbation from life history stage to life history stage and the cumulative effect of all of those insults that is really causing this massive bottleneck for reproduction in corals. And at a time when 
corals are experiencing mass bleaching events all over the world, arguably what they need in order to recover from those acute stressors are reproduction and growth. Those are two of the most critical processes after a devastating event. And those are two of the processes that are being most challenged right now by warming and acidification. And Dr. Albright, remind us, why is coral so important for marine ecosystems and for humans? So, I mean, in developed countries, we largely appreciate them for their aesthetics. We let, they're incredibly beautiful places to go visit and dive and snorkel on a vacation. But what a lot of people actually don't understand is that these are a source of livelihood for hundreds of millions of people around the world. Um, so coral reefs are one of the richest ecosystems on the planet. They harbor more than 25% of biodiversity in the oceans. So if we lose coral reefs, we've lost 25 to 30 percent of marine biodiversity and they also are the primary food source for in terms of reef fish providing protein for people for hundreds of millions of people worldwide and they provide us with coastal protection so they build these massive calcium carbonate structures that rise up from the ocean floor and if you have storm surge or a hurricane that's increasing in intensity across an ocean it'll slam into the reef before it slams into all of the coastal development and it's been shown that reefs actually mitigate up to 97 percent of of wave energy. And so in addition to saying these are some of the most biodiverse and aesthetically beautiful ecosystems on the planet, this is also a food security issue. It's a human security issue. The ecosystem services that they provide us with are valued at almost $400 billion a year. Wow, an incredible figure. Dr. Rebecca Albright, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.